Hey y'all, Dr. Marta Perez here. Welcome to my channel. Today we are going to discuss bleeding in the first trimester and subchorionic hemorrhages. I'm going to share information about them and I'm also going to tell you about my personal experience of with subchorionic hemorrhage during my pregnancy. So don't forget to hit subscribe so that you don't miss any of my educational content all about pregnancy and birth every Friday and let's get started. <music> first trimester can be a time of a lot of anxiety for people and having bleeding during the first trimester can be really stressful. Bleeding can be a sign that a miscarriage might be happening, but bleeding is also really common in pregnancies that do not go on to become miscarriages. They go on to become healthy pregnancies and particularly some people who have bleeding have something called a subchorionic hemorrhage or a subchorionic hematoma. What is a subchorionic hematoma? So a subchorionic hematoma is basically a collection of blood that happens between the chorion, which is the early formation of the placental tissue, and the uterus, so the myometrial lining. Blood develops in that space. They can be large or they can be small. When a person becomes pregnant and an early embryo implants into the uterine wall, it actually starts invading the endometrial lining and creating connections and opening up blood vessels. And what we want is this to be a fine-tuned process where there's both enough opening up of blood vessels on the uterine side to adequately supply nutrients to grow a healthy pregnancy. But we don't want so much opening up of blood vessels that it creates too much bleeding or a clot between the chorion, the preg developing pregnancy and placenta, and the uterus. So there's lots of reasons this delicate balance can be a little off and there can be extra bleeding like a subchorionic hemorrhage. So subchorionic hemorrhages can be picked up on ultrasound. That person may not see bleeding. There may just be a little blood that develops there and it never actually comes out of the person so they don't see bleeding. But a lot of people do have bleeding with a subchorionic hemorrhage. There's also various other causes of bleeding in the first trimester. So not all of them are because of the pregnancy. Some bleeding can happen from the outside of the cervix. The whole area gets engorged with blood vessels and sometimes people can have spotting or bleeding. They can It can be a sign of infection sometimes. And so when you have first trimester bleeding, it's totally okay and a reason to see the OB and get checked out. Again, it can be because of a lot of things, some that have to do with the pregnancy developing and some that have to do with the changes in our bodies due to pregnancy. I'm specifically going to talk about subchorionic hemorrhage or subchorionic hematoma, which is sometimes abbreviated as SCH, you might see, um, because it gets particular attention. Again, it's very common for bleeding in the first trimester to be because of a subchorionic hemorrhage, but sometimes people won't have bleeding and they'll see something on ultrasound ultrasound in the first trimester. So what is the deal with subchorionic hemorrhage? Does it matter besides being really anxiety producing? I think this is an opportunity to go over data. It can be really, really distressing for patients and honestly for me too, when you see a lot of bleeding in the first trimester. Miscarriages also cause bleeding, so it's really difficult for an individual person to know what's going on and it can often take several days to get into the doctor to see the doctor in the first trimester when having subchorionic hemorrhage. Okay, so what is the data be behind subchorionic hemorrhages that were found? Let's say you had bleeding, you went to the doctor, they noticed the subchorionic hemorrhage on ultrasound, but they also saw that there was a fetal heart rate and no signs that a miscarriage was actively happening. What does that mean for the rest of pregnancy? Well, the data that was out previously in the 90s and earlier 2000s was kind of all over the place. Some of the data suggested that people who had bleeding in the first trimester and a subchorionic hematoma were more likely to have a miscarriage or another pregnancy complication later on. Whereas other studies showed no difference at all, that first trimester bleeding didn't make a difference in pregnancy outcomes or miscarriage. These studies were mostly small studies and they didn't have ideal statistical methods. The biggest studies to date on subchorionic hemorrhage in the first trimester came out in about, I think it was 2019. I have the studies linked down in the show notes. The authors of this study presented two different papers. One of them looked at the risk of miscarriage associated with subchorionic hemorrhage in the first trimester. They included people both who had had 
bleeding with their subcoronic hemorrhage and those who hadn't, but it was picked up on an ultrasound. And what they found was that there was no link to pregnancy loss under 20 weeks. So people who had a subcoronic hem hematoma were no more likely than people who didn't to have a miscarriage. That's really reassuring for patients to hear. They also continued to look at that same group of people and look at pregnancy outcomes during the entire pregnancy. And they also found that there was no increased risk of having a adverse event or a complication in the pregnancy for even the rest of the pregnancy in people who had a subchorionic hematoma. That also is really good news. They did find that people who had reported vaginal bleeding in the first trimester did have somewhat of an elevated risk of having a preterm birth and having fetal growth restriction, but it wasn't the subchorionic hemorrhage itself. It was the presence of bleeding in the first trimester, which is sort of interesting. It definitely needs more teasing out. I don't really know what to make of that interaction. This study that showed no increased risk of miscarriage and no increased risk of pregnancy complications was true no matter the size of the subchorionic hemorrhages big ones or small ones, or the number of them. Now they did only study pregnancies that were single pregnancies. So they didn't study twin pregnancies who, who had subchronic hematoma. A lot of times in science, we pick one specific population to do a study on. I'm gonna talk now about my personal experience. So in this pregnancy, when I was in my first trimester, I was on a night shift at work and I was actually in a patient's delivery. A patient was having a baby and I felt a big gush of fluid and I could feel it even trickling down my legs. And I felt a big cramp associated as well. I went to the bathroom and just saw a lot of blood and I was pretty worried. I thought for sure, you know, I had a cramp. It was a lot of blood at once. This is likely a miscarriage. I was about eight weeks pregnant. And it's not ideal that this situation kind of happened to me as I was in someone else's delivery, they were having a baby, it was a joyous moment, but it really was a scary moment for me. Um, I had a colleague do a quick ultrasound. The fetus still had a heart rate at about eight weeks. And so I knew that there's nothing we can do when there's bleeding in the first trimester. There's no medicine, there's no treatment to stop it. You just have to kind of wait and see if it becomes a miscarriage or stays safe and the subchorionic hemorrhage doesn't result in a miscarriage. Not that it would result in a miscarriage, but just what is the true diagnosis? So I, the bleeding stopped and then I ended up having a very similar episode of bleeding about a week later, then the bleeding stopped again and another similar episode of bleeding about a week after that even. So there are three times from weeks like eight to 11 in the first trimester where I had like pretty significant bleeding. I had to wear pads, it was uncomfortable, and it was also kind of made me nervous. Now I knew this data. I knew that subchorionic hemorrhages are not associated with an increased risk of miscarriage on their own, but miscarriages can still happen. For my age group, the rate of miscarriage is about one in four, one in five. So I just kind of told myself that I can't control what happens. I'm just along for the ride in this and think good thoughts. That's what helped for me. Um, I have a lot of patients though that it's really hard to stay positive, especially if they've had trouble conceiving or have a history of loss in the past. It can be really difficult and triggering to undergo bleeding in the first trimester. I always recommend that this is a really great time to start getting coping mechanisms and mental health care in line and possibly starting medication if you notice that anxiety is really, really bad. Anyways, that was my personal experience though. It was pretty unpleasant. And so I definitely understand, you know, why my patients feel really distressed about having bleeding in the first trimester and how stressful it can be. Cause like I was there too. I hope this episode was really helpful. I hope it shined a light a little bit more for you about first trimester bleeding. I hope it helped you understand that subchorionic hemorrhage or subchorionic hematoma itself is not associated with miscarriage. But in the moment, I know that bleeding in the first trimester can be really stressful, especially until you have an opportunity to have an ultrasound and check to see if the pregnancy is still progressing. And unfortunately, I don't have a quick fix for that one. Please don't forget to hit subscribe. You wanna tune in every Friday where I have educational videos about pregnancy and birth so that you can have the best experience possible. Take care.